Welcome to Washington Legal Foundation's webinar program. My name is Glenn Lamy. I am Vice President for Legal Studies here at the Washington Legal Foundation. For those of you not familiar with the foundation, we are a 44-year-old legal policy and uh, advocacy organization that started out in 1976 as a litigating organization, getting involved as, as an amicus in uh, a wide variety of, of issues that affect uh, free enterprise and, and, and business development. And uh, we've grown from there into an organization that still has litigation at its core, but also, <clears throat> excuse me, has a legal studies division, which I'm vice president of, that puts on programs like this one, publishes uh, about 50 publications a year, and also has a, a very well-trafficked blog. Um, it seems quite appropriate that we're hosting today's webinar from WLF's headquarters here in DC, which is a building that was the residence of Alice Roosevelt Longworth, daughter of the original trust buster himself, President Teddy Roosevelt. President Roosevelt may have spoken softly and carried a big stick in his foreign policy, but when it came to domestic policy of antitrust, he was not quiet and readily swung that big stick. The Biden administration signaled earlier this year that it would speak loudly and swing a big trust busting stick with the installation of outspoken antitrust proponent Timothy Wu at the White House and the nomination of Lena Khan as an FTC commissioner and then with her instant elevation to chair after her confirmation by the Senate. The Senate will soon be voting on the nomination of attorney Jonathan Cantor to head the antitrust division at the Justice Department. If the Senate does confirm, Cantor, Wu, and Khan will make a formidable triumvirate. In just three months' time, Chair Khan and her allied commissioners have reshaped the gauntlet that mergers and acquisitions must endure. More changes and perhaps enforcement actions are to come. We've convened this panel of MA practitioners and antitrust risk counselors today to help you make sense of an environment for business deal making that is frankly still evolving. Each of our panelists will offer some opening thoughts and then we'll proceed with a moderated discussion. We also welcome your questions, which you can send to me using the Q&A function at the bottom of the template. Uh, before introducing the speakers, I'd like to note that um, this program is being sorry, this program is being recorded. Uh, as I said, if you use the Q&A function um, to send your question in, and also I've put a couple of links in the uh, chat function of papers that are relevant to, to WLF's uh, work in this area. Introduce first, Patrick Bach, who is a partner in the Brussels, Belgium office of Clary Gottlieb, Steen and Hamilton, focused on antitrust counseling and antitrust litigation. He joined the firm in 2003 and became a partner in 2013. Marin Boney is an antitrust and competition partner in the Washington DC office of Kirkland Ellis. She joined, she, rep she regularly represents clients before the FTC and DOJ in complex merger reviews and global and uh, government investigations. And then Mark Gidley is our, our final speaker. He chairs the global antitrust and competition practice at White and Case, resident in the firm of Washington DC office. He served as the acting, acting assistant attorney general for DOJ's antitrust division from 1992 to 93 for his responsibility for all civil, criminal, and merger matters at the division. So we thought it would be interesting for each participant to talk a little bit about what they've been hearing from their clients on the proposed changes emanating from the FTC and the broader antitrust policy environment. Patrick, can you get us started off and then we'll hear from Marin and then from Mark. Sure, I'd be happy to. And thanks very much, uh, Glenn, for the introduction and, and for organizing. It's great to be here. Um, well, there certainly have been quite some developments um, at the FTC, in particular in this last year, but in the antitrust uh, world more broadly. Um, uh, I'd say, you know, at this point, it's still, it remains early days. It remains to be seen um, whether some of the changes that have been announced and statements made. Um, in particular, out of the FTC will really lead to substantive shifts in, in enforcement and, and policy or lasting changes in procedure. That said, I do think that clients have been made uneasy um, and in some cases really frustrated by changes that have either withdrawn established guidance without replacement or appear to be increasing bureaucratic hurdles without any real reason or, or purpose. Um, you know, on the substantive side, that's included things like, and I'm sure we'll talk about this quite a bit today, um, the, the FTC's unilateral withdrawal of the joint DOJ, FTC, and by the way, also bipartisan vertical merger guidelines. Um, it's also included on the substantive side, the introduction of prior approval requirements and merger settlements 
um, with a pretty onerous 10 year uh, runway and potentially even beyond 10 years, um, applying not just to the merging parties, but even to investor buyers. But there've also been changes on the HSR or in the, at least in the application of the HSR rules that have created some additional uncertainty. Um, one of the big ones there is that uh, the FTC has suspended um, early terminations for transactions that don't raise any issues, um, which was initially supposed to be just temporary. And there was sort of suggestion that this would be a bit like what happened in March, 2020 when the FTC instituted e-filing and, and so it would just be a sort of a two week uh, delay. Now it's been going on for the better part of a year and we'll see how much for how much longer. But of course about 50% of all transactions are, are in the past were did qualify for early termination and just didn't represent any, any issues. And all of those transactions have now resulted in a drawn out, uh, a drawn out at least full 30 day review. Um, but there have also been sort of uh, smaller changes in the HSR uh, in the application of the HSR rules, and in particular in, in, in the application of what are called informal interpretations, um, which is guidance that the, that the agencies will provide the parties when they ask for it um, on the application of the HSR rules. Um, that in part have been withdrawn. Some have been publicly announced as having been withdrawn. In part, though, they've been just withdrawn kind of stealthily without much, uh, without much uh, fanfare or, or even any announcement. So we saw one instance, for example, where we contacted on a, on a transaction for a client, contacted the PNO uh, recently, um, and on, on only upon consultation, we're told that actually a um, an informal interpretation that is on the FTC's website still, not, a, not counted as, as superseded, um, has now been superseded. Um, and that uh, in particular, what this was about was an in, informal interpretation that confirmed the position that the sort of acquisition of a bundle of exclusive licenses could be noti notified upfront um, at once upon signing even if the exclusivity for some of these licenses doesn't kick in until several years down the road. Now, again, they, the agency just sort of said, nope, sorry, that, that no longer applies. And what that means is that you now need to seek clearance for every single one of those licenses within a year of those licenses becoming exclusive, which is quite a, um, a big deal for, for many industries, in particular the pharma industry, where um, you know, this is a common setup in, in pharmaceutical collaborations that you would sign up front a deal that involves um, uh, potential exclusive licenses for a whole range of different products that will be developed. Um, and this now means though that you've, you've got not just multiple HSR filings for a single transaction like that, but also increased uncertainty and, and puts the parties in the difficult position where they have to agree commercial terms today for licenses without the certainty that the FTC will even clear the transaction um, down the road when those licenses become exclusive. So quite some, um, uh, quite some impact by even some small rule changes uh, like that. Now, again, that's just one small example, um, but I think is representative of this broader trend that's resulted in uncertainty and unpredictability and has made it more difficult for companies to, to navigate merger review in this last year. Patrick, Bryn, Marin? Sorry. <laughs> I'm glad. Thanks. Thanks for organizing this. Um, I, I would say overall, just the, the volume of inbound questions from clients has, has significantly increased. Um, the just both on the front of general counseling questions, you know, uh, someone seeing an article in the Wall Street Journal and forwarding and saying, how could this impact us? Is there anything we need to worry about here? Um, and sh more sharply on the deal front, uh, clients being much more willing to engage on antitrust early in a process and, and seeing really heightened importance of paying attention to everything from SPA provisions to kind of worst case scenarios, even in deals that you know, are, are fairly considered to be really low risk. And I think we're all trying to balance uh, between recognizing the enforcement environment has changed, especially for clients in higher profile industries but also don't want to catastrophize here. Um, you know, the, the antitrust laws have not changed and the legislative proposals that, that at least seem to be getting the most bipartisan traction 
have been pretty narrowly tailored to impact a few big tech companies. And many of the FTCs announced second request process changes really just align FTC practice with what the DOJ has already been doing. What, what strikes me is what has really changed is the rhetoric, particularly on the FTC front, just getting an uh, overarching sense that the commis commissioners in the majority think that mergers are somehow inherently bad for the economy and that companies that want to engage in M&A activity are, are likely to be inherently bad actors. And in my experience, that's not true. Um, I think that would, most of us would agree. It, it's a lot more common for me to have a client that's looking at an acquisition focused on an, you know, an adjacent space where they have zero presence. And if they have antitrust risk, it's from some small product overlap that my client would, could care less about and would honestly prefer not to acquire at all. Um, so one of the things I'm hearing is more reluctance to engage in these kinds of deals. Uh, because it may get hung up on the small product overlap that's irrelevant to their deal rationale. You know, we, we've all given this, the standard speech about how the agencies care about how the deal will impact competition in that specific overlap market, even if those products generate, you know, a meaningless amount of revenue to the parties or is irrelevant to why they want to do the deal. But previously, clients, I think, could get more com confident that if the agency didn't get comfortable with the overlap, they could pivot to offering to divest that business and still get the deal done in a reasonable amount of time. And I don't think we've seen evidence of that strategy no longer being on the table, but the language coming from the FTC suggests it's at least higher risk to go into a deal with that plan. And I think the other thing I'm seeing is sophisticated clients, especially in the tech space, are much more aware of and um, nervous about vertical issues. You know, this is always something that as antitrust lawyers, we would have diligence when we're looking at a potential deal, but clients, they tend to tend to be a little dismissive of whether there was really a risk, especially if both parties' market shares were, you know, relatively low. I think things started to change there when the Salesforce Slack second request became public knowledge and, and clients realized that even if one party didn't have, you know, a 45% market share or whatever, um, that there is still a risk that the agencies would want to take a, a much closer look at potential impacts. So I think overall what I'm seeing is um, antitrust really being in the forefront of clients' minds, even in deals that two years ago they wouldn't have expected it to be, a, a, you know, the key issue in a deal. Hey, Glenda, I think you called on me uh, with mute. Uh, I'm Mark Kidley at White & Case, and I'll start out with a disclaimer, which probably everybody would buy into. Uh, my remarks today are entirely academic. They're not on behalf of any client, and not on behalf of White & Case, and not on behalf of my partners. I'm a partner and may not even be on behalf of me, but these are some thoughts that we'd share with you informally today. Uh, with that caveat, I would say, uh, first thing we see at White & Case is we look at global filings. And looking at the big picture, just what we're coming out of before the election, before the change of personnel and policy at the agencies, obviously, was the impact of COVID. We saw a drop overall about 10% globally in merger filings to the extent that that's a proxy for merger transactions in 2020 versus the prior four years. And it's come roaring back to the extent that any of the data has been released. You've seen it in the United States. You see it in Europe. And we're seeing it throughout other countries around the world. So it's good that the economy is roaring back with merger uh, notifications. That said, I think there are enormous policy issues that are being raised. And one of the things that's interesting about antitrust compared to almost any other area of law is that the statutes, the United States statutes are basically a sentence each for section one of the Sherman Act, section two of the Sherman Act. Policy really defines sort of the, the meat of the sandwich uh, more in antitrust than I think in SEC securities enforcement or in other uh, areas of law. So normally when there's a change of administration, we say X or Y will become hot. I think all bets are off when Tim Wu gives a speech as he did in Fordham and says the last 40 years of antitrust are flawed. And you're like, wait a minute. Well, first of all, that's my tenure back in the 1990s. Well, I, I'm sitting up straight. And, and second, um, that's like Obama and Clinton and Bob Petofsky, these figures in the United States that are sort of lionized as uh, 
maybe they were left of center or right of center to where you yourself or your clients want to be, but they believed in government, they believed in the agencies. And so I think that alone should shock people. Uh, I'm a child of Watergate. I actually remember the Watergate summer hearings. And if you were a Republican going into government, you, you had that seared in your mind. And the Tunney Act at Justice, right? We, we had to be so careful at Justice in doing merger relief. So the idea that the White House has a branch that's into antitrust policy, that's a very strange thing. We were very guarded at Justice back in the day, and it was a while ago, uh, in, in what we would tell the White House, and we certainly wouldn't talk about active merger investigations or criminal investigations. That was just the third rail. And I think it's different today, and maybe, maybe that's what the election wants, but it's leading to a lot of you know, interesting policy sort of ripples from that, that viewpoint. Um, on mergers, yes, I think the um, p and losing their opinions and sort of in an arbitrary way uh, is so different. If you, if you actually took ad law in law school and you know, the agency will have much more time than those Article Three judges to really zero in and study your industry. You know, all this care that you thought in the United States as an American lawyer would be part of the administrative process. A lot of that seems out the window right now. Uh, second, the early termination thing, our clients of course chafe at that. There are a lot of filings that are just, you know, some kind of, you know, change of ownership between two different owners. There's no strategic issue at all. And there they are, they have to wait 30 days. And that's basically a tax on the economy and on the free flow of, of goods and, and, and you know, uh, company control. I think another thing that I would always point out to people is, you know, this sort of rhetoric against mergers has consequences. If there are barriers to exit, I can't sell my business. Well, if you think about it, and this is a Chicago school thought, but I think mainstream economists on both sides acknowledge the phenomenon, if there's a barrier to exit, it can become a barrier to entry. The capital won't flow if you look at private equity, they may have very defined time periods for exiting the investment. If they can't exit by selling uh, or it becomes much more cloudy than the predictable case before they make the acquisition, which itself might've been very pro-competitive is out the window. Finally, I do a lot of thinking, maybe I shouldn't, about due process and extraterritoriality. And some of that's white and case and some of that's just uh, where, I, where I am. But uh, from a due process standpoint, and I'm not gonna talk about the specifics of the transaction, the recent Article 22 change in policy where the FTC had an issue uh, with a transaction and filed court papers, this is the grail thing, but I'm not, I'm not talking about that particular client or facts, I'm just talking about the, the policy. The FTC files papers in court to stop it, then phones the EU, according to public reports, and I think it's been acknowledged, the EU alters its view of Article 22 and says, yeah, we're open for business, just call us, and if you can't get the deal blocked, we'll do interim measures. And then, you know, all of a sudden, now your, your transaction's stuck in flypaper. If your transaction didn't have a nexus to Europe, that's a very interesting, and I think, very troubling, uh, alarming development. And we in the merger world have been worried about that with little countries saying, you know, here I am, you've got $15,000 in sales, but I'm going to, you know, I want, I want a filing and uh, I may not have the most transparent process. It's, it's a little bit more alarming to see the EU become sort of the enforcer of a U.S. policy qualm. You know, my view is if the U.S. government has a problem with the merger, present your case in court. That's sort of the notion of due process that we have. And I think there's a constitutional right to that too, by the way, from a property standpoint. So I'll get off my stump, but uh, I, I think that the extraterritorial issues uh, with what we're seeing in that case are very troubling and give me a lot of pause. Anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you everyone for your opening thoughts. Um, one thing Mark noted was that there had been an increase in, in uh, mergers in terms of, of filings. Um, one of the reasons why the FTC chair and her, her like-minded colleagues have stated that we need changes in the rules um, is that we've seen a rise in anti-competitive mergers. Marin, in your opinion, has the commission really provided an adequate sort of support for that supposition or, or is that something that's, that's yet to be seen? 
Yeah, I, I think on the sheer number of mergers, that the evidence is there. And, and to be fair, the volume this year has been unprecedented. Um, on the more anti-competitive deals point of that statement, I, I'm not really sure what the, the metric is there. Um, the agency enforcement levels over the last couple of years have seen a slight uptick, but, but there's nothing dramatic that suggests a major shift. Um, it, it's unclear whether Chairwoman Khan was including in the anti-competitive deals bucket transactions that receive clearance subject to a consent decree. Um, as I mentioned, some of the statements from her and others of the FTC have implied that um, companies that sign deals that they know going in will require a remedy are somehow doing something wrong. Um, and so this might be part of what she was talking about in the, the anti-competitive deals, you know, uh, rising rapidly. Uh, we, we do have some insight into her thinking because of her academic work prior to the prior to being nominated to the FTC. And some of the policy statements that the FTC has released, like the statement rescinding the, the vertical merger guidelines, they have regularly cited to empirical studies. Um, but largely, there's not um, a, a lot of uh, empirical support or, or studies uh, or guidance for some of the more the newer theories that we've heard the FTC is considering. Um, but I think the private bar is largely trying to understand how they would fit into the, the current metric of the antitrust laws. Um, things like concern about ESG or impact on climate change um, or diversity initiatives, like how those types of issues that we're aware of the FTC is starting to ask questions about how, how those would be first fit into the, the framework of the antitrust laws. And second, um, just what, how empirically you would address any concerns that they may have. Um, you know, the FTC has done a study on non-reportable transactions by big tech companies, but it was much more focused on understanding basic metrics about the deals, you know, the size of the transaction, number of employees, age of target, that, those sort of metrics not whether, not evaluating whether any of the deals had an anti-competitive impact. Um, so it was only published a couple of months ago. So we'll have to wait and see if there's further follow-up or if the FTC takes any further action with respect to any of the deals that, that were part of the study. Um, but I think going forward, they have announced that there's going to be some more initiatives around gaining information that, that would, I think be useful both to FTC and the private bar in terms of uh, how these enforcement priorities are going to be uh, effectuated in practice. Um, the new draft FTC strategic plan includes an objective relating to study the impacts of merger and non-merger conduct on workers and compensation. So these sort of things along with the upcoming joint public workshop on labor issues, I think will provide more clarity here. You know, for example, there's been a lot of talk about employee non-competes but it's not clear um, whether the FTC and others are primarily concerned about low wage workers, or they've also seen evidence or, or have concerns that non-competes could impact, like for example, software developers in a way that the agency sees as problematic. Thank you for Thank you for mentioning the study there. Um, kind of leads into my next question, Will, I think, which is, the commission also seems to believe that, that different standards and different methods of merger review should apply depending upon the industry impacted. Uh, Patrick, what are the pitfalls of such a sort of sector by sector approach to mergers? Yeah, no, actually, that is very true that, the, that there has been a number, there have been a number of suggestions now um, by commissioners, um, Blue and others, that certain industries deserve more attention and in this regard, more scrutiny um, uh, when it comes to, to merger control than others, and that there might be pre-existing anti-competitive elements in certain industries that uh, might need to be examined as part of any merger review, which sort of breaks down the, the idea of merger specific um, harm and, and starts to go into the direction of, is there harm that's already existent in, in particular industries that, that now the agencies are going to use the merger as an excuse to, to look into. So there have been concerns voiced, um, for example, by commissioners that uh, some industries' prices are already too high. Uh, 
um, that innovation is too slow, that there's a history of anti-competitive conduct or even just a history of alleged anti-competitive conduct in some industries. And so therefore they deserve more scrutiny that executives, individual executives who might be part of, of emerging companies might have been accused in the past of misconduct of any type. Um, there might be a history of a mistreatment of labor or, or environmental, um, environmental issues in a particular in industry. And so the idea is that those mergers in those industries where you have these types of issues should deserve greater scrutiny and, and a more fulsome assessment of, of potential harms. Now, I think there are a number of risks that, that uh, with going down that uh, path. The first, of course, is just inconsistent outcomes across different industries. It makes no sense that you would treat one murder differently than another simply because it happens to be in a different industry, but, but, but it doesn't create any more harm than a merger in another industry. It would result in, in over enforcement and, and blocking of pro-competitive transactions in some cases, you know, transactions that will bring serious benefits to consumers faster in the pharma space to go back there, life-saving benefits even to, to consumers. And this whole inconsistency will also just create more uncertainty. Uncertainty as to what facts and evidence the agencies actually intend to consider in any particular industry. Will they consider different facts and evidence of harm in one industry versus another? You know, if the scope grows beyond simply looking at overlap areas or potential foreclosure concerns, where are the boundaries um, from one industry to another? Are they different from one industry to another? Uncertainty as to timing. In fact, we've seen now a couple of relatively no issue or very low issue um, PE deals that have now resulted in a second request in the last couple of months. And there again, you know, should you assume that just because you happen to be in a particular industry, you might almost by definition go to a second request, even with a no, no issue deal. And then of course, uncertainty also as, as, as regards remedies. So I think all of this, just to go back to the point that Mark made earlier, is just a, a tax on, on the economy, a tax on pro-competitive transactions and, and uh, risks really creating inefficiency and, and delay. Um, one process change that's received a lot of attention is the FTC's return to so-called prior approval provisions in merger, merging party settlement agreements. Aaron, can you explain the significance of this process change? Sure. Um, so just as background, th these are provisions that can be included in a consent decree where merging parties agree to divest certain assets in order to get the deal cleared. Um, the FTC recently announced it is going back to a pre-1995 policy that it so at least some consent decrees will impose prior approval requirements both on the merging parties and on the divestiture buyer. Um, the, so the merging parties will need to get FTC approval for deals in certain product and geographic markets, which may be broader than the product geographic markets uh, covered in the consent decree. And divestiture buyers will need to get prior approval before selling the divestiture assets to a third party. So I think the impact here is it's clearly going to make divestitures more challenging, but how much and how great the impact is will really depend on, on the details. So far, we only have a few examples, so there's not much information to going on. So, you know, hearkening back to what Patrick was talking about in the, in the intro, this is another area of, of significant uncertainty right now. Um, you know, how will product and geographic markets be defined in the pre-approval provisions compared to the consent decree? Um, the three examples that um, we have so far were for dialysis, dialysis centers, supermarkets, and generic drugs. You know, product market definitions in, in these industries are, are fairly straightforward. Um, it's be interesting and really informative to understand how this will be implemented in a matter like the FTC consent last year that ordered divestiture in entry level on premise sparkling wine. Um, or in a, a technology market where market definitions can sh shift considerably over the typical 10 year consent decree period. I think the second key question um, is going to be, will, uh, will there be carve outs for where prior, prior approval is not needed if the relevant deal would already require an HSR filing? And the issue here is, you know, obviously the, the HSR process has statutory timelines that merging parties can plan around. And at the end of the day, the FTC has to go to court 
to challenge a deal under the antitrust laws to prevent the parties from closing. And the FTC prior, prior approval process isn't bound by these limitations. So in the three examples, the divestiture prior provisions have been narrower than the ones imposed on the merging parties. The time periods have been shorter and there are no prior approval required for the sale of the entire company, which presumably would be an HSR reportable deal. So no matter how these issues shake out, there's likely to be an impact, but really how significant it's gonna depend on what we continue to see. I think the, the two biggest issues are one, buyers are gonna be very cautious about agreeing to hell or high water provisions, even if they're fully willing to divest the overlap business. I, I, I see them hesitating to sign up to a requirement um, to agree to a prior approval requirement that could end up being very broad. Um, you know, it's one thing if it's limited to or closely related to the divestiture product market. But if the product market ends up being defined more broadly, you know, that buyer is going to face a significant disadvantage in future M&A that could be caught up in the prior approval requirement. They're, they're going to have to compete against other bidders that will be able to offer more certainty on deal timing because HSR, they'll know that they could get that deal through in 30 days and just overall clearance risk because it won't be clear what if the FTC prior approval criteria for clearing a deal is going to match up with what would fall under an HSR reportable deal. And two, I think divestiture buyers are also going to be concerned about limitations on, on selling the assets and how it may impact their existing business. You know, for example, if a company was interested in acquiring a plant through a divestiture process, that may mean they need to go through a prior approval process if they want to sell off a larger business unit the plant would become part of, and they might not want to take that risk. I think it will chill interest, but will be less significant than the impact on the merging parties, because it's something that you can get feedback on from the FTC before you before a divestiture buyer signs the divestiture purchase agreement. You know, unlike um, uh, merging parties where the buyer has to sign up to an efforts provision well before the FTC has given any feedback on the deal, divestiture buyer is in a better position to assess like the real risk in that specific deal of, of how broad or what the divestiture provisions are going to look like. And also the exclusions in the, the two of the three examples we've seen so far, where the divestiture buyers don't have to get prior approval if they're selling the whole company, suggests that the FTC staff has recognized this dynamic and is willing to work with divestiture buyers to come up with something that meets the FTC's enforcement needs without negatively impacting them in like unforeseen ways. Mark, I'd also like your thoughts on that, especially to the point that uh, DOJ hasn't similarly returned to a prior approval provision. Do you see that happening it, it, once uh, Mr. Cantor is, is confirmed? Uh, assuming that he's confirmed or whoever is confirmed in that slot, uh, it will be on their desk. Uh, part of me thinks that there's a symbolic action of I'm, I'm do, getting rid of, you know, I'm, I'm going to be the tough person and, and be tough on prior approval. Um, the DOJ put out a merger remedies manual in 2020, which I think on this point was, was quite sensible. It basically said there are going to be times when we may case by case use prior approval. And I think there's broad bipartisan support for that and recognition that industries differ uh, facts differ. There, there's a time and a place for it. I think what really upsets people, and to, to Marin's point, that really can affect even whether a deal will be done or the terms on which a deal will be done, will be the uncertainty of this very broad, uh, throw the baby without uh, out the bathwater kind of uh, uh, reimposition of prior approval. And as I understand it from the FTC guidance, it's actually very broad that if you got a second request and abandoned the deal, they could seek some kind of relief, that it stretches into the hands of the divestiture buyer, and that it expands beyond the deal, the, the point Marin's made, that that, that is very uh, hard for parties to get their minds around, that they could go into uh, a merger and all of a sudden, uh, now they've got this prior approval. And I think one of the things that goes back to my due process thought is, Congress has set this up that if the agencies and the parties can't agree, you go to a court and there's a neutral uh, courthouse not very far from the FTC and the DOJ where you adjudicate that dispute and that respects property rights. Congress could have created self-enforcing orders by uh, these agencies, um, 
you know, so at any rate, I, I, I'm, I'm concerned by it. We'll see what DOJ does. One of the comments of our of our of our of our participant is marked that the FTC 1995 prior approval policy, on which I worked full disclosure, was a case by case policy. Yes, and I think that's why the <coughs> remedies thing. And uh, I see Patrick nodding. I think most of us would say we're not against prior approval ever. It's more, you know, me mechanically doing it in every deal and being subject to the potential of something that's beyond the contours of even the overlap. You can analyze the overlap going into the deal. Uh, an agency that doesn't have that restriction, that, that's very concerning to the parties and creates enormous uh, uncertainty. One of the other policy decisions that FTC has made that DOJ has not yet made is its withdrawal on the reliance on the vertical merger guidelines. Um, do you expect DOJ to take that action at some point in the near future? It's funny, I think of the 2020 guidelines as a reaction to the loss in the AT&T case. Um, they at least uh, have the virtue of acknowledging double marginalization, right? The idea that when you stack the two companies together, the one thing that goes is the SG&A of the second company. You'll just have one bit of overhead, not two overhead. So the fancy term is double marginalization. And I, I recently did a deal uh, where I went back and looked at the economics literature. It's one of those rare areas of agreement that the elimination of double marginalization in vertical mergers is a real thing. That's not to say all vertical mergers uh, should be permitted. It's simply that there is a countervailing efficiency that's extremely real. So I, I think it's a real uh, sort of gut check for uh, Mr. Cantor or whoever uh, sits at his desk. Um, uh, at the Assistant Attorney General's desk, um, what they do on vertical mergers. Uh, I went back and looked at the AT&T decision and was struck that the DC Circuit cited the 1984 vertical guidelines. Um, so uh, I think if the agencies are going to go after vertical mergers, and fine, they, they're within their rights to do that. I think that in throwing out the last 40 years is a mistake, uh, one thing that the, the policymakers of this administration need to think about is the loss of guidance that because the laws are so open ended, the creation of guidelines, as difficult as they can be, they can take a year or two. You know, in the United States, we love competition so much. We have two competition agencies. They yell, they scream, they fight, whatever, and they hammer out some guidelines and the economists weigh in, the lawyers weigh in, all these different stakeholders weigh in at least that's something that we lawyers can tell our clients and show our clients. And I think when you go to no standards and no guidelines, one thing the government, uh, I think it's short-sighted about is the private bar does a lot to enforce the antitrust laws and to help companies comply with the antitrust laws. And that's not just wind, we all do it every day. And when the guidelines go out the window, there's a real loss and not only predictability, but just compliance. Uh, spotting the issue and, and helping companies comply. Marin, does the, what, what was the three commissioner majorities rationale for scrapping the vertical merger guidelines and it does it really hold up to scrutiny in your, in your mind? Yeah, I, I think there are two main points. One legal, the, the second economic. I, the legal point is pretty straightforward, just that the Clayton Act does not distinguish between horizontal and vertical mergers. You know, the standard is simply just does it, does the deal may, may substantially lessen competition in any line of commerce. The, the, the economic point is a criticism of the 2020 VMG's treatment of efficiencies, specifically the, the elimination of double marginalization or, or EDM. <clears throat> um, and the statement challenges EDM both on a theoretical basis and um, in gives some examples where they, they thought that the, the facts as they played out in re reality post-merger supported the, the, um, the, the challenge of whether or not EDM is pro-competitive in, in reality. And on a theoretical basis, their, their focus was really on whether the, the assumptions underlying the model are actually present in any real life situations. And um, the real life examples that they focused on were studies of vertical mergers in healthcare um, that found the, the studied mergers did not achieve the expected efficiencies. And also the AT&T direct TV merger um, where after the merger, AT&T raised prices. 
Um, but there wasn't a lot of uh, additional commentary on, on you know, whether there are other reasons driving those price increases in, in the uh, commissioner statement, but that was one of the examples they gave. You know, and, and as Mark noted, there is a lot of empirical support um, from both economists that you would consider you know, hard cool Chicago school and ones that are, are more um, across the whole spectrum for EDM um, and the, the pro-competitive impacts it can have in mergers. This is another area where there's a real risk of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Um, vertical mergers, like all others, are very fact-specific inquiries. And there may be some deals where um, the it is unlikely that the, the parties are, are going to be able to achieve or the, those kind of efficiencies, or that just because of the structural or market conditions, it's unlikely that they'd be passed down to consumers. But there's a lot of other deals where that is definitely going to happen, or it's, it's very likely that it's going to happen. So I think that um, it, you know this is just another area where the facts really matter, and the wholesale withdrawal of any sort of guidance um, does make it much more difficult for parties to evaluate uh, what kind of transactions pose risk. And um, you know, for us to, as Mark said. <laughs> um, play a role of helping weed out the problematic transactions up front. Patrick, the, the, um, the upcoming merger of, for the proposed merger of, of Amazon and, and MGM, I think makes a really interesting uh, case study for all of this, especially in the context of that it's Amazon and there seems to be more of a focus on internet platforms and content and, and the access to content and the two-sided market nature of those sort of things. Any thoughts on, on how you see that going forward? So it's interesting. I mean, it's it's going to be, you know, I completely agree with, with Mark and, and Maren's comments on you know, the, the fact that this really makes it extremely difficult now to advise clients and the importance of the private bar and, and advising clients on, on, on transactions like this. Um, yeah, I, I think that what you will see is that increasingly it will just make it more and more difficult for law firms that aren't kind of inside the beltway advising clients on these types of transactions on a day-to-day -day basis um, to provide the kind of advice that their clients are looking for um, on, on vertical mergers and, and beyond. Um, you know, with respect to the, um, to the Amazon uh, MGM case, it is kind of interesting. Um, just after Chairwoman Khan was um, appointed, um, Senator Warren wrote a nice long letter to the chairwoman um, expressing a number of concerns about the Amazon MGM deal. Um, as I'm sure you can probably guess, those went well beyond traditional foreclosure concerns or overlap areas. Um, so concerns you might expect in you know either input or customer foreclosure on streaming or or content creation, product entertainment, um, and so go well beyond um, the, the the established analysis that was in the vertical merger guidelines and that's that's for which there is there is court precedent. Um, she expressed concerns, for example, about increasing Amazon's leverage across all markets in which Amazon is, is active by further strengthening the Amazon Prime product, about the effects on workers, given that uh, Amazon has faced complaints um, from labor unions and other, and other uh, work um, uh, workers' representatives about their labor practices, about the effects from Amazon Web Services, getting access to Netflix customer data and what that might do. So, and so on and so on. I mean, it, it just goes, it, it just, just mushrooms, um, wide range of issues. Um, so I, I think given that and, 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 other, um, and other criticism of the transaction publicly, I think the FTC will now no doubt look into all of these different concerns um, and will no doubt feel free you're doing so now that they're no longer bound or at least so they think by the by the structure of the uh, the vertical merger guidelines. But at the end of the day, I think it's difficult to see how the FTC ultimately establishes and really brings a case that goes to court to, to prove um, uh, theories of harm that go beyond the established 
foreclosure input and customer foreclosure theories that have that have that have been well proven so far. Um, but I guess in the meantime, in terms of practical advice for the parties, I assume the parties will be um, looking to substantially comply with the second request as quickly as possible, and 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 really holding the FTC's feet to the fire on this, um, because. Um, I think giving them the, the leeway to, to, to investigate all sorts of these um, unclear concerns could, uh, is unlikely to result in a, great, in, in, in a great amount of certainty. Sort of picking up on that, if there's, there is a challenge of a vertical merger that might otherwise have passed through under the vertical merger guidelines, how much of an obstacle will the DC Circuit's decision on the time order AT&T merger that DOJ tried to, to block and it was challenged successfully by the parties. How, how, how difficult that, is that going to be for any of the agencies to overcome, you think? And I think that was to me. It was to anybody who wanted okay. to answer. Sorry, but I didn't, I didn't know it was right. oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I would say, obviously, uh, anytime the agencies litigate, they have to be very careful about the DC circuit. Um, a lot of that uh, opinion is fact bound. It comes down to the economics model between Dennis Carlton and Carl Shapiro. Um, but there are passages in there and there's a reliance on the 1984 vertical guidelines that I think um, will provide guidance to a district judge. I, I think one thing as a Washington uh, lawyer, uh, we've always said and believed is that I think the district judges in the DDC, our local district court, treat mergers in a very special way. And um, it's either considered uh, the biggest plum of being a, a federal judge in, in the District of Columbia or the most challenging spotlight uh, grabbing thing that, that uh, she or he doesn't want. But at any rate, they take it very seriously. Many of them clear their dockets to do a merger trial. And obviously um, from the internal perspective as HLA Hart uh, said and was beaten into me in law school. Um, they're looking for what's the guidance? What do we, well, what's the source of law? And when all these guidelines get thrown out the window, uh, that's going to be a very interesting thing. And I think they're going to go back to precedent even more. Uh, so that means they're going to go back to Clarence Thomas's 1990 opinion and Baker Hughes. They're going to go to some of the really key circuit decisions. So I think it's an irony that in throwing out guidelines, one of the funniest things about the government is they write guidelines and then the government, uh, the, the judges follow the guidelines and quote them because again, they're looking for the internal perspective. How do I decide this case? What's the law with a capital L that I'm, that I'm applying? Because this thing is so open texture, this, this Clayton Act, this Sherman Act. So it's funny, I think that's an irony of the baby with the bathwater tossing out of guidelines is, the precedents, the older precedents will become more uh, interesting. I think the other thing that's an anomaly is that due to the Expediting Act in the 1960s, Philadelphia National Bank, all these decisions went to the Supreme Court. So they sit there with a US citation on them, US reports, but many of the things that are in there are utterly archaic. And the guidelines of Republican and Democratic administrations have long since uh, discarded a lot of the things that are still in uh, U.S. reports. So at any rate, the, 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 those are a bit of random observations, but I think real world, uh, those are things that are going to confront the agency the next time they're in court. So as, as you said, the outset marks a lot of antitrust law more than any other body of law in, in the U.S. that's based on statutory law is policy-based. So is it fair to say that a lot of the guidelines, either the vertical merger guidelines or the horizontal guidelines, the, the principles that are in there are endemic of what the case law has, has developed to say. So even if you throw out the case law, I'm sorry, even if you throw out the, the guidelines per se, the case law that, that supported them is still out there. Is that a, that a fair supposition? I would say the, the thing about the guidelines, I, I worked on them in 92 with, with Bobby Willie and Janusz Hordover. And by the way, I just want to note his passing. It, 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 it tears me up that we lost Janusz. Uh, this year. At any rate, you know, um, I think one thing about the 92 guidelines, the 2010 guidelines, uh, is they enabled uh, economists to get a lot of economic principles into the guidelines. Even HHIs is a Bill Baxter idea, right? So those are bringing in 
economic principles that then become sort of law with a capital L to the extent the guidelines are these uh, quasi law source. So I think one thing that's interesting is you have the law, which was very much product market, brown shoe, define a market, you know, pretty much structure conduct performance uh, was, that, was that school. And maybe we're back to structure conduct performance, but the uh, intervening guidelines permitted a lot of times for what we all said was sound economics, not just Chicago school, but sort of across the spectrum, some economic consensus. And that would go into the guidelines and very much influence the guidelines over the years. So I think the guidelines have been sort of a, a, a way for the economists to have a seat at the table and uh, in a way that you know, policymakers found very helpful. Patrick, Marin, any thoughts from either of you on, on that point before we move away from the, the whole concept of guidelines? You're still muted, there you go. No, no, I was just gonna say, I mean, I agree completely with what, with what Mark said. I think that, you know, uh, again, throwing out the throwing out the guidelines, it's easy to throw out guidelines and without coming up with any, without with any other structure. Um, and so the, the, the real question to me will now be to see, you know, what do they come up with? There's still language around, oh, we need to, these, these investigations are fact specific, we need to follow the evidence, et cetera. But at the end of the day, I think the, the onus will really now be on the, uh, on the FTC to come up with, with a new set of guidelines and to square that with um, the precedent that's out there. Um, and maybe maybe the other thing, Patrick, is we haven't really talked about this at all. We, we focus so much on the leadership, but there's an enormous body of career lawyers and economists at these agencies, and they had huge input in, in various ways in the guidelines. And even apart from the guidelines, if you do a lot of mergers in pharma, you do a lot of mergers on X, Y, and Z, you get a staff that's got a way of looking at pharmaceutical mergers that's based on eight, 10, 20, 50 mergers in that industry. Uh, and it's tremendously empirical. It's not even written up, but it's sort of the lore and, and they, they know it. And I think in a way, in a world with no guidelines that first of all, the ability of the staff to get ideas into the guidelines that then clients can read is gone. And so then it's really trying to translate experience from past deals and then saying, we think the staff will think this we don't know what's going to happen on that three to two vote at the very end. And that that's tough for business. In particular, where you're also destabilizing the staff by telling them that the, the ways of doing things over the last 20 years, 30 years in the, in, in reviewing pharma deals are, uh, were flawed and, and, and need to be reviewed as well. Absolutely. Does that sort of approach, basically shift more discretion and, and, and authority to the, to the chair's office and to the commissioners themselves, where if, if the staff has to learn a new way to do something, then those that are with the commissioner or the, or the, or the chair are going to be the ones directing it more than the staff. Well, my own experience is when every merger is a jump ball, then, you know, you wind up, I think it's very hard for one, two, three, four, even five merger decisions uh, for people to try to discern the pattern, you know, when they're against different industries and you're reading over and over the final consent order or whatever. Um, guidelines have the benefit of cutting through most industries and um, being a broad application. Um, Marin, I didn't, I hope I didn't jump in front of you on that. No, I, I, I was just going to say that um, one thing that I, I noted in the, the commissioner's statement is about when they rescinded the the 2020 guidelines is they specifically said that they were they wanted to to rescind them before any courts relied on them because I think that there is this strong feedback loop between the agencies developing guidelines that might not necessarily be 100% consistent with court precedent but then the courts look to the guidelines cite them and they become precedent um, so I, I think that that's you know right now there's kind of a since the the guidelines were in force for so long, there's kind of a, a gap in that the courts know that the agents, the current agencies don't see them as valid, but there's nothing else really for, the, for them to, to rely on or, or look to for guidance. Right, and normally, 
Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, oh, go ahead Mark. And then normally, too, when chairs, um, Chair Potofsky or whatever, thinks that there's something a little bit off of the guidelines, as he did in 1997, you amend them. You know, so he added further guidance. Uh, he did it while I was doing Staples Office Depot, so it's very memorable to me. It was announced at the spring meeting, which is often where these things get announced. You know, you know uh, the longer you do this, you go, the, the, you know, the, the, these three summer, you know, these three spring meetings were all about my merger or whatever it was. But for Staples Office Depot, they kind of tweaked the guidance during the merger review, which I have some issues with. But that was the way uh, the Chairman Potomsky dealt with uh, the three to two world and whether he would allow what he considered uh, a three to two merger and where would efficiencies uh, exist because that, that merger did have enormous efficiencies. So anyway, to me, you know, taking the merger guidelines and saying, I think ED, you know, like I'll put out a statement, EDM needs to be modified or tweaked or, you know, we'll hear from us soon is a little bit different than saying we, these guidelines don't exist. So what are we to make of this raft of, of warning letters that were sent out to, to companies that the HSR waiting period has expired, uh, but the, the letter said we're still here, FTC, in other words, and, and are there, there might be opportunities for us to challenge those post consummation. Um, Aaron, what would you tell your clients in those kinds of situations or what should antitrust lawyers be thinking about when, when having to deal with their clients on, on those sort of surprise uh, letters that they might get? Yeah, I, I mean, it depends on the specific circumstances because it doesn't always, but I, I would say when these letters first started appearing, there, there was a lot of concern about how to interpret it and, and understanding what it actually meant. Um, we've been seeing these for, I think, several months now. And my view is the letters, they're essentially stating the law. Um, you know, FTNC and DOJ always have the right and ability to investigate it and challenge a deal even that has gone through the HSR process. It's really rare, but there are a couple of examples. Um, and we just haven't seen much evidence that the FTC has continued to vigorously investigate the transactions where they sent these letters, at least in you know, the vast majority of cases. And given that the FTC, you know, they always have the ability to issue a second request where they have real concerns and don't seem to have much hesitation about issuing second requests. Um, I, I don't think that it's as nearly as dramatic a, a, a warning as, you know, when they first came out without any context, we were worried about. Anybody have thoughts on that as well? I agree. Plus, I think the, the, the more time goes on, the more difficult it's going to be for them, as is the case in any transaction, uh, for them to prove that any of the harm that they're seeing or alleging is really murder specific. So I would tell clients not to worry too much. I mean, obviously, if there is a specific reason for concern, um, as the facts, you know, in a fact-specific matter, take a look at it. But I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be overly concerned about these letters. Yeah, I would agree. Patrick, is is the increased uncertainty for merging parties in the U.S. reflective of a larger international trend, or is this something that that has been sort of moving forward in the U.S.? What do, what do European antitrust regulators regulators think of of, of Chair Khan and her current approach? So I might answer your first question, but leave it to the European antitrust regulators to give you their views on, on Chair Wynne Khan. No, I think, uh, um, uh, you know, I think it's interesting. I, I, so going back to something that Mark said earlier, um, one of the catalysts for uncertainty in markets outside of the US and with, with antitrust um, changes to antitrust rules outside of the US has been the US. Um, so, you know, this Article 22 point where, um, for example, the, the Commission historically, the European Commission historically had had guidance out there that actually told the part, told um, uh, emerging parties, but also national competition authorities not to refer transactions to the European Commission under Article 22 of the EU merger rules where they're not notifiable in the national, within the national uh, regime. So, the the you know if you had a if you have a merger control regime in Austria and and Austria doesn't uh, require a notification in that instance the Commission discouraged and even 
said that it wasn't appropriate for Austria to be referring a transaction to the, the European Commission. Now, in part, as a result of US uh, pressure to, to, for the Commission to sort of take control of some of these transactions that are just not notifiable at all in Europe, the Commission changed its guidance and said, no, 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 even if a transaction isn't notifiable, you have a merger control regime in Austria or in France, or you name the European member state, you decide that the transaction might have an impact on trade between the member states, you think it might be somewhat anti-competitive, you refer the transaction to us, we, the Commission, can now review the transaction when nobody was otherwise allowed to review the transaction in Europe. And not only can we review the transaction, we can review it for a period, for an indefinite period, they're limiting themselves to six months post-closing, but that piece too is, is, is quite astounding because unlike in the US, the Europeans don't have a general ability to, to review a transaction post-closing. So that's created a lot of uncertainty um, with, with companies who understandably are worried now that they're going to be faced with a, with, an in, with, a, with a review where they otherwise assumed there was not going to be any review in, in Europe. Um, and it was so clearly tied to the, to the Illumina Grail um, case where the FTC was looking to try to prevent the parties from closing, had to go to court to seek an injunction to prevent closing. But as soon as the European Commission started investigating as a result of this Article 22, was able to drop the was able to drop their attempt uh, at, a, at an injunction to prevent closing. So, uh, you know, I think um, it's just one example of the U.S. kind of pushing uh, regulators outside of the U.S., including the European Commission and, and national competition authorities in Europe, to add this level of of uncertainty. You see it in other areas of too. You see it in the in the pharma uh, merger control. Um, task force um, that the, the U.S. Uh, agencies together with the Canadians, the U.K. and the Europeans have set up in which they're hunting for new theories of harm in, 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 uh, in pharma merger cases and encouraging um, the Europeans and others to, to, to come up with new theories of harm as well. Um, you see it in the U.K. Um, who has been pulling in a whole number of uh, cases under their share of supply test um, that include uh, mergers that don't even touch the UK for the most part, um, and yet still are being pulled in um, to the CMA. So, uh, you know, I think it is a trend that you're this, this level of uncertainty around what antitrust regulators will do is, is increasing everywhere. And I, I do think that the US is, has been a um, a catalyst to 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 creating that or having that effect. I want to ask one more question that that sort of ties this to our our last program, which was focused on uh, antitrust policy and rent seeking. Uh, where Josh Wright, former FTC commissioner, was one of our speakers. There certainly seems to be in an, in a world where you have more discretion at the commission, an opportunity for competitors or if there's multiple suitors for, for a particular company to, to sort of try to use the antitrust laws and the review process to prevent acquisitions and mergers that, that they wouldn't necessarily want to see happen. Is that, is, it, is, is that a fair statement that there's going to be more opportunities for that under a more uncertain, more multi sort of layered um, approach by the FTC or, or DOJ? Absolutely. Maria, do you want to kick it off? But, yeah, yeah I, I see this a lot, especially in, in tech deals where the vertical issues would center around integrations with competitors. You, you know, there are a lot of spaces like MarTech where everybody integrates with one another. It's just part of the business model. It, it's not, there's really no rationale why companies would be, would be able to stop doing that. Um, but the... I think the staffs are really good in, in horizontal deals at filtering out uh, things competitors are saying to them for valid reasons and things that um, might be motivated by other causes <laughs> um, versus in the, in the vertical realm where the competitors may have a more valid concern. I think it's a lot harder for staff just to, to vet um, statements that are self-motivated and really there's no problem with the deal. They just want to throw rocks at it. 
versus, um, you know, just parsing through that, I think is a lot more challenging when the competitors are the, the ones you're worried about being harmed by the deal. Yeah, I, I would say, I, I would say, Glenn, that uh, from my standpoint, one of the big questions to ask yourself at the end of 2021, early 2022 is, is antitrust politics or is it policy? Is it law? And um, it's, it's, everyone struggles with this. We struggle with it. Uh, when I was in the government, we would sometimes be looking uh, at a merger and saying, is this, you know, is this something where microeconomics gives us an answer or the law gives us an answer? Are we being social engineers and we're choosing this particular buyer, or this particular remedy, because we just emotionally want this or that uh, remedy or outcome? Uh, and you always tried to go back to the guidelines or the law and really uh, do the right thing. But that was always sort of the line. I think, first of all, when you go to all the dimensions that Marin mentioned of you know, ESG or climate or labor, uh, we're no longer in the 40-year consensus, 50-year maybe consensus of just looking at consumer uh, harm. Will there be an increase in prices either at the producer level or the consumer level uh, because of an increase in concentration? And that depends on the, on the particular merger. When that's not the litmus, I think you're going to see more opportunities for competitors to complain. And I think uh, it's, it's a boon day or boon times for government relations firms who can create a political football out of anything. And if there are enough economics uh, at stake, uh, they will be busier than ever. People used to joke that the 92 guidelines, the 2010 guidelines were a full employment act for economists. I think as you increase uncertainty, if you did a little graph, then the government relations firms and PR firms get more involved. And it does become more, more like politics and what's popular. And I, th I think, you know, if you had Chair Khan in the panel, uh, she might well say the, the popularity of the merger is something I should take into account. So I think, is it a public interest standard or is it a consumer harm standard? Um, those kind of choices are really fundamental in merger policy. Patrick, any last thoughts? No, and, and to add to the, to the uncertainty in that world as for direct investment reviews are becoming more and more uh, um, important as well in parallel to, to um, the, this uncertainty on the antitrust side of things, that just further creates the opportunity for public interest to, to, to play a role in, in, in regulating uh, the review of these transactions. So I completely agree with that. I wanna thank you all for joining us today and taking much of your valuable time to prepare and participate in our program today. Thank everyone for joining us as well. Hope everyone has a, a safe and happy holiday season. And, and once again, thanks very much. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for organizing.